So welcome, welcome to everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be your facilitator for today's event, the virtual launch of Advancing Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights in Africa, Constraints and Opportunities. As we know, there are longstanding contestations over time in the field of sexual health and rights on the continent. And in response, we've witnessed political organizing, development of legal instruments and frameworks over time, as well as expanding scholarship in the field. Um, and this editorial volume really synthesizes some of the cutting edge developments in the field, um, allowing us to reflect both on the current state of the fields, um, as well as compelling us to imagine beyond our prevailing realities. Um, but that is enough from me. We have an amazing group of panelists who will take us through um, this hour and I dare not steal time from them. So in terms of process, um, my name is Rudo Chigudu and I am the facilitator for today's um, virtual launch. I am going to introduce to you each of the speakers in turn who've been allocated five to 10 minutes each. After all of the panelists have spoken, we will have a question and answer session so I encourage that during the presentation, participants drop into the Q&A box, um, the questions that they have. And at the end, we will address as many questions um, as the panelists have, have time um, to respond to. So without further ado, I will call upon Professor Franz Villoun, who is the director of the Center for Human Rights, Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria, his main research interest is international human rights law with a particular focus on the African regional human rights system. He has published numerous articles dealing with international human rights law and the book International Human Rights Law in Africa first published by Oxford University Press in 2007. I will hand over to you, Professor Franz Villoun, um, for some welcome remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Rudo, and uh, yes, uh, may I just say a warm, warm word of welcome to all our attendees. I see that we, we are just about to break the 100 mark of attendees, and that's not shabby, I think, for a book launch. And so thank you very much for attending, for spending this hour also with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And welcome also to our panelists and indeed the editors and the authors of this wonderful book that we can re refer to as advancing. Um, so congratulations also then to the, to the editors. Uh, we have Gladys here who will speak. We know that Dr. Professor Durujai and Professor Nguena uh, are also the co-editors and uh, Professor Charles has been instrumental in putting all this together, together with Ebenezer and Gladys. We, we commend you, we congratulate you. We know that this is quite recent the book has been published on the 2nd of July. So uh, this certainly is a very timely uh, moment to focus on this uh, book and it's, um, it, uh, what it stands for. If you permit me, moderator, I'm going to say five brief things about the book. The first is wonderful that it is open access. I think it is so important that publishers like Routledge also uh, make publications like these uh, accessible. Otherwise, clearly, it would have been very difficult for us to have access to this book. So please note in the chat that the uh, fully accessible text uh, reference is given there. It's wonderful. You can browse around that for free. The second is that I think this is a landmark moment, a landmark for African scholarship within the burgeoning field of normative expansion on sexual reproductive health and rights. We could call, especially in Africa, within the context of the African Union, this these last two decades, in a sense, would be the decade of sexual reproductive rights. It starts with the Maputo Protocol, 2003, 2005. Quickly, it enters into force. We have 42 African Union member states now party. And much of the soft law uh, standard setting of the commission then also focuses on uh, these rights. We have the first general comment of the African Commission devoted to Article 14, those aspects related to HIV. The second general comment of the African Commission related again to Article 14, sexual reproductive rights, but the other aspects. In the same year that the general comment number uh, two is uh, adopted, uh, 2014, we also have the groundbreaking resolution 275 
from the African Commission that deals with the curbing of violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity imputed or real. We also saw in 2017 the very, very instructive guidelines by the African Commission on sexual um, violence, combating sexual violence and its consequences. So I see this book as an important complement, as, as an affirmation of African scholars' interest in this burgeoning and important norm elaborating uh, um, development within the African context. I see this as a, as a signal that African scholars are taking these normative developments seriously, draw attention to it, and provide their constructive yet critical analyses of, of what is uh, taking place. The second point is that I think the book reads as something that's very contemporary. There's a sense of uh, the acute and the immediate in the way that the editors have chosen and the authors have presented, I think, their chapters. So it is quite apt that the book uh, is appearing within the um, Routledge uh, Contemporary Africa a series of publications. And I... I didn't catch that. Could you try series. again? My apologies. So I think the immediacy of the scholarship is also very striking if one looks at it. And I think it doesn't mean that there aren't precedents. Clearly, all our editors and authors have contributed before. And I'll use a small prop here. In uh, 2014, we had this uh, book published by Pulp on sexual minorities, edited by and written by African scholars. And importantly, we also had um, in, in 2014, that was 2017, my apologies, by two of the co-editors, we had at, at this book, Strengthening the Protection of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights in the African Region Through Human Rights. So it is wonderful to see this continuity and to see the added focus, I think, on context and on nuance that we find in this particular edited volume, perhaps uh, compared to the previous work. My third point is to celebrate the multiplicities that we find in the book and multiplicities of various countries. There are eight country studies, but there are also sub-regional studies. Multiplicities in terms of themes that are being covered, and I'm sure many of the speakers will refer to these, the multiplicity of institutional arrangements from the regional, the African Commission is looked at, the Committee of Experts on the Right of the Child, and then also at the national level, the state, obviously, various state organs, including national human rights institutions. And then also looking uh, strategically in, in terms of strategies that could be adopted to improve, including uh, thorough investigation of strategic litigation in this field. My fourth point, very briefly, is to speak as a human rights educator. And to, to say the book for me is also one that flies under the flag of collegiality mentorship. And I think Professor Charles and Gwena will join me to say that it is gratifying to see that not only among the editors, but among the authors, we have a number of students, students in the programs that uh, we have started at the program, one in human rights and democratization in Africa, but importantly also one in sexual and reproductive rights in Africa. And some that have advanced to doctoral studies, and I will not name specific names. So with uh, these few remarks, let me just celebrate once again, the uh, publication of this book, a book that I think is a landmark for African scholarship, a book that speaks to contemporary issues in a very uh, acute and immediate way, and a book that is really worth our reading and Fortunately, a book that is accessible to us because it is published in an open access format. So thank you very much to the editors for having made this possible for the authors to have contributed. And thanks for those who made this event possible. I think Professor Charles and Gwena uh, kind of set it all up in a way together with the co-editors. And then at the center, Yolanda and Taruna are the ones who hold this together technically. Thanks to all. Once again, welcome to all the attendees. And we look forward to a very productive session together with you. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, Thank Professor Vivian, um, for really grounding us um, in what the book really um, represents. I will move us on um, to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Laleng Mufo King, who is a medical doctor with expertise advocating for universal health access, HIV care, youth-friendly services, and family planning. She's affectionately known 
as Dr. T. She is the current UN Special Rapporteur on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. She has been commissioner at the Commission for Gender Equality in South Africa and advisor to the Technical Committee for the National Adolescent Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Framework Strategy in South Africa. Dr. T is passionate about making sexual and reproductive health services available to everyone, regardless of socioeconomic status, including sexual and gender identities. I will hand over to you, Dr. T. Um, what do you really see as the connections uh, between this book um, and your portfolio and line of work? Thank you, Rudo. How many minutes do I have? You have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon to uh, profs, my favorite professors, uh, Prof. Balloon and uh, Charles Gwena. And um, thank you very much for this invitation. And I think you know how important the issues of um, sexual and reproductive health rights are to me. And um, congratulations to the team and all of the amazing scholars who have contributed um, to this book, Advancing Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights in Africa. And I wanna start by defining what sexual health is. And I often draw on the World Health Organization's working definition that clearly states that sexual and productive health does not only relate to the absence of illness or disease, but rather a positive state of well-being. And unfortunately, many sexual health interventions only focus on the risks and potential negative consequences. Um, however, such an approach, I think, fails to acknowledge an individual sexual rights, um, their own particular desires and, and self-determination in relationships and their own agency around sexual pleasure. And I think this can still, of course, a discussion on what positive realities of sexuality, sex, um, sexual expression mean um, from different people and from wherever they are located, both socially um, as well as we know in terms of the politics of the body, the politics of sex, the politics of sexual pleasure. And I often refer to myself as a pleasure practitioner because of this particular approach that I take on sex and sexuality. And my aim and many other people who do um, the work around sexual pleasure particularly are looking to positively influence attitudes, behavior, technical, legal and policy interventions towards a better sexual health, sexual rights and sexual pleasure approach. And I often talk about the triangle, right? Because often people will speak either about sexual health, which is very medicalized and diseased in, in, in its approach, or talking sometimes about sexual rights, that, but still very discriminatory in how they view sexual rights and who's allowed um, to be who they are and express that. And of course, the issues of sexual pleasure were even in my own medical training, were never really discussed. Um, and so I think even in clinical practice, there is a lot that's lacking in terms of how um, we look at the issues of sexual pleasure and particularly of women and feminine presenting people. And of course, overall, there's been a lack of clarity um, and I'll even say commitment, right, among policymakers, practitioners and some advocates in how we conceptualize and integrate all of these different elements in the delivery of sexual and productive health programs into services, information, education, um, as well as how they are reflected in policy. And it's a very important to talk about a policy approach to sexual and reproductive health rights because we know that it's often policy and the law that's used um, as a tool to police people um, that further entrenches certain taboos and sometimes very harmful um, gender stereotypes. And often it's these um, approaches and the policy frameworks um, that will either even criminalize same-sex relationship or criminalize adolescent health, which often has a direct impact on sexual health, for example, in terms of uptake of services and the use of contraceptives um, or reproductive commodities, even access to safe abortion procedures, for example. So we have to look at all of that, the issues around rights and how those are protected and, and promoted in policy, and also how the policy can be directly translated in services that are affirming and are dignified that can ultimately result in positive experiences. And I wrote my own book um, called The Guide to Sexual Health and Pleasure. And in there, I said that the unshackling of women's bodies, particularly sexual desires and pleasure, 
is the revolution for many women across the world and that we need to be bold in reclaiming our sexual pleasure and identities and our, sex and our expression. And this is true for all gender diverse people too, who have historically had their bodies serve as a site of political warfare. And so it's my belief that advancing sexual and reproductive health rights in Africa, particularly as a geographical region of the world must center um, the, the right of people to have di uh, to direct um, their own experiences in terms of sexual health, sexual rights and sexual pleasure. And we know there is, of course, a global pattern of controlling sexuality. And this has some origin in, in colonialism, um, where bodies of women, other gender diverse persons, and feminine presenting people too, have long been a site of violence where human rights abuses and violations have occurred. Um, and in my first thematic report, um, outlining the strategic priorities of my work to the Human Rights Council, particularly looking at the integral element of the right to uh, everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical health. We know that we cannot talk about that right and those attainable, the highest attainable standard without talking about sexual and reproductive health. And many of the obstacles that stand between individuals and their right to the enjoyment of sexual and reproductive health are interrelated, they are in, in, entrenched and also operating at very different levels. Some are of course a clinical care, some are at the level of health systems and some are un, in the underlying determinants of health. And this is why I think this book is really particularly important because it gives us different perspectives, different um, scholarship and, 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 and learnings from people who are located themselves are politically very different, but also socially also very differently. And I think it's important to also often always uh, reiterate the fact that the issues of sexual and reproductive health are human rights issues and the issues of non-discrimination, equality, privacy, um, as well as integrity, autonomy, dignity, and, and overall well-being uh, are human rights issues and they are related to the, the level at which sexual and reproductive health rights can be protected um, and, and they are an integral element of realizing the right to health. And I'll make a, 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 you know, a reference to COVID-19 as a current uh, health emergency that we are all trying to survive and how the measures around COVID-19 have resulted in amendments, right? In laws, um, in, in, in our own social contracts between people and our governments in directing the movement of people. But we also know um, that in some countries there's been a chance and opportunistic use uh, of these circumstances to implement draconian measures with further curtail human rights um, related to SRHR as well as LGBT rights. And, you know, referring again to the Human Rights Council report, I was also speaking about um, COVID-19 regulations um, that have been seen attention and resources being diverted from sexual and reproductive health rights, um, such as abortion services, transgender care and affirming care. Um, and, and we often know that the regressions in LGBT rights um, you know, often will lead to further criminalization of same um, sex relationships and actually undoing the work that many people have done on the ground in terms of um, you know, advancing human rights. And I'm pleased particularly today um, to see yet another effort um, to defend, um, to bring forward, to advance, to promote sexual and reproductive health and rights as human rights. Um, and I think, of course, as we continue to resist and to persist against the injustices, it's particularly important as well um, to, to celebrate such moments as today. And I have no doubt um, that this book particularly will bring an even more rich um, uh, conversations, bring more zest um, to this work of advocacy and especially being done by civil society um, and, and driving sexual and reproductive health and that agenda of a positive but inclusive approach um, and holistic approach into policy and, and into those um, spaces like parliaments, like international human rights spaces, where we can all collectively amplify the work that we do. And of course, with the book presenting all the multiple themes, um, and again, I see this book as, 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 as an important part of the work of human rights um, in terms of promoting, protecting, as well as fulfilling the right to health. And I'm certain that the future of sexual and productive health rights is really well taken care of um, in the hands of such amazing and brilliant scholarship. 
and I particularly, um, you know, wish to continue the work and the relationship that I have with the center and the university because we know um, that it will take really, um, uh, you know, continuous effort and we need longevity in the space to do this. And I think victory is certain um, as long as we are working together um, around the same goal. And again, congratulations, um, colleagues and friends on this amazing, amazing book. And I will be drawing from it as I continue doing my work, of course, at the United Nations. Um, and I can just say to Prof. Charles, you can expect a call from me soon as we get into the next um, uh, cycle of, of, of the report on, on sexuality and gender-based violence. And there's a particular reason why um, we have gone with the framing of sexuality as an important element when we are discussing gender-based violence, because we know um, the duality and the multiple experiences um, that people have, that the violence is not just because, for example, they of the agenda being women, but they may be, of course, in terms of sexuality, uh, being a lesbian woman and how the, um, you know, those, those systems, uh, you know, exert themselves on those people. And so I will be again um, calling on all of you and using these resources in my work and rest assured that um, uh, the work continues with the necessary force. And um, yeah, and I'm here as well uh, for, for, for anyone uh, who would like to, to participate and, and find ways where we can make sure that your work and your brilliant scholarship also finds expression in those um, international human rights spaces. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Dr. T, um, for drawing strong connections between um, experience in the, in, in the lives of people on the continent in, in terms of sexual and reproductive health and rights um, and the centrality of, of a rights discourse. Um, without further ado, I will turn to Professor uh, Joy Azadio, who is Professor and former Dean of the, of the Law Faculty, um, in the University of Nigeria and Suka, a lawyer, activist, and feminist scholar with research focus on women's rights, including sexual and reproductive health and rights. Prof. Azalio was former UN Special Rapporteur on trafficking in persons, especially women and children, between 2008 and 2014, during which time she traveled to several countries to determine the causes, mechanisms, and scope of human trafficking. She's an active member of the civil society movement in Nigeria and the founder of Women's Aid Collective, a nonprofit that works to promote and protect the rights of women and young people. Uh, Prof. Azalea, um, I hand over to you. Yeah, Rudolph, you um, yeah I, I think you can hear me. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, I want to uh, congratulate uh, the authors of this uh, very important uh, book that France has uh, described as a landmark uh, book uh, publication. And I agree entirely um, on advancing sexual and reproductive health rights, SRHR rights in Africa, constraints and opportunities. And the book couldn't have come at a, at a, at a right time. Uh, this book is coming uh, to the world stage or to the continent at a time that the COVID-19 is ravaging the world and uh, also Africa. Uh, and it is important because within this pandemic, SRHR right has taken back seat. It is now at the back burner. And this book is actually bringing us back to having this uh, in both national and regional discourses. Uh, it's also a time that we have seen spike uh, in uh, sexual and gender-based violence and also uh, massive uh, violations of uh, sexual and reproductive health rights, especially of uh, women and adolescents. Uh, and with the inequities we see in access to vaccine, uh, with regard to the pandemic that is threatening uh, humanity. Uh, there is also the threat that all the gains since uh, Cairo uh, and since Beijing uh, will be wiped out overnight. So we are living in a very precarious uh, time. And uh, importantly, when, uh, I mean, uh, for me also uh, being involved in civil society is also a time I've, 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 we've seen this spike and we're dealing with huge uh, cases, even in this uh, COVID pandemic. So I want to congratulate the authors 
and the publishers for especially for the free access we know we are africans we are in africa we are challenged every day the economic recession following this pandemic is even making it increasingly difficult for us to pay and access some of this so having an open access uh, is, is 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 very important Important. And then the book is quite rich, diverse, uh, different perspective in uh, uh, over 14 uh, chapters of, of the book. And I found uh, quite interesting the, some of the issues um, highlighted, especially we got to uh, deeply entrenched uh, uh, obstacles that we've seen, obstacles that uh, affect uh, uh, maternal, maternal, uh, maternal rights, for example, safe motherhood. Uh, which is uh, essentially abrogation of a uh, woman's right to life. And we are seeing high incidence of that because even with the uh, COVID measures uh, put in place, people don't go to hospital for being afraid and people are not also being treated in hospitals. And then uh, we have seen a lot of even strikes by doctors, like even currently resident doctors are on strike. And since this COVID, I think they've been on strike even three times. And you see people again going back to traditional death attendance and then uh, um, and then uh, you know, we're just dealing with COVID, Ebola, cholera, and why gender disparities persist. And we see discrimination, especially discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, uh, when we should or when we know already that um, the principle of non-discrimination and equality is already part of Jews' cogents, but there shouldn't be this derogation. But when it comes to SRH, right, you find uh, a different uh, thing happening. Uh, adolescent sexuality is, uh, is very important. And within Africa, uh, despite also the African Charter on Rights and Welfare of the Child, and then uh, we, and the protocol, we've seen that adolescent doesn't have a discernible legal uh, status. And then the cultural, cultural social norms, uh, including societal morals, have brought resistance to even gains made with regard to sex education and family life education. And these days also people are rejecting that in school. And with the sexual minorities that we are discussed, uh, and those cost rates are very, very real. Uh, because these days you see people just equate sin with crime. The sin is a same crime, and they are criminalizing homosexual conduct of things that we inherited from uh, colonial rules that have since uh, left their criminal uh, uh, status books. And then now uh, we are reenacting it, like the, the, the paper that also discussed the situation in Nigeria with prohibition of same sex uh, uh, marriage. So, um, if based on also what I've been said earlier and what the book also adumbrated, uh, and what we know that WHO defines right to health and the special rapporteur on a, on a right to a highest attainable standard of health, I've said it's highest attainable standard of health for everyone. Uh, if, if that is the definition and is the working definition, and then you look at within the context of Africa, then you know that we are far, far, far away uh, from there. Uh, so we are far away uh, fr fr from from realization of those rights that yes we may have uh, them de jure uh, but de facto in terms of practice uh, we are seeing a, a, a gulf is a gulf uh, we we notice already that um, uh, the African Charter the protocol to the African Charter Mobutu Protocol already have very good provisions and of course is of higher threshold than than CEDAW. And uh, with resolution 275 that, that, that was discussed, I think the journey to that uh, resolution 275 is a very interesting one that we extrayed and examined in the book. Uh, so we look at the constraints, but I, I think I like the book for not just looking at the constraints, because if you look at the constraints, it's quite depressing. And uh, you begin to say, when are we going to get it right? And when are we going to, in Africa? Will, will women, girls, and others ever realize uh, uh, this right? And uh, we've seen one of the things I've known, you know, participating in African Union things and at the level where you have a regional. Uh, uh, impute or G77 is almost common resistance uh, with regard to any issue on SRHR. And uh, interestingly, the resolution 275 gives us a lot of hope. And uh, in terms of opportunities, I like uh, particularly uh, the chapters on, uh, I think, chapter 11, 6, uh, involving male, male responsibility on SRH, I think is very, very important. I like uh, also chapter 11, advancing the right of uh, sexual and gender minorities, uh, the, the African uh, Charter Resolution 275, 
Um, so if you look at the role of litigation, I think this is one of the most interesting uh, aspects, the role of litigation, lessons uh, uh, from other uh, African countries like Kenya, Uganda. I found the, the, the Zimbabwe case very interesting, especially uh, because it also uh, it affects the impl domestic implementation of, um, of international treaties, the way the court also uh, talked about state responsibility with regard to, to implementation of that. And, and then also uh, the, I think is the Botswana uh, case that was also discussed. The role of N NHRI, that is the National Human Rights Institution is, is paramount and, and looking at regional treaty bodies and, and what they can do. And uh, at the beginning, it was like, you know, cases are not being uh, reported to them. They're not taking up cases, but we've seen increasingly uh, that not just regional bodies, the regional bodies do have a role, but again, you see sub-regional bodies like ECO as being quite active in terms of uh, some of the SRH rights issues. Uh, recently also, uh, the court in Nigeria gave uh, compensation to, to women who were commonly rounded off as prostitutes and then, uh, you know, just incarcerated or detained. And it was a very common phenomenon that necessitated even a setting of a special panel of inquiry for which I served on it. And it was actually the National Human Rights Commission with the office of the vice president that set up the special SGBV panel to look at those uh, kind of harassment uh, that women were, were facing in FCT in particular, but also around the country. And I was uh, part of uh, the people that looked at it, this case, but then some other organizations took it uh, to court and, and, and then uh, have got some compensation in the last, uh, was it last week or, or just two weeks ago that uh, it was decided. Uh, the role of litigation is, is, is really important. And then I, I'll come back to that in terms of opportunities. Uh, because going forward, the civil society um, is very crucial, you know, to, to work with the civil society. And I agree in some of the recommendations I've seen. And then not only will I recommend this book for, you know, civil society, gender rights activists, academics, but I think for policymakers, uh, there is a need for policymakers also to be made to understand uh, some of these issues. Uh, the opportunities uh, there, the, 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 the sustainable development goals, also uh, leaving no one behind, especially goal 17 on partnership uh, is very important. We know, of course, SRHR rights in terms of budgeting. And this is also maybe one of the areas that we need to do more work on budgeting for SRH, SRH rights in Africa, because uh, the budget is simply you know, you know, not there, or, you know, traceable to anything. Um, so uh, whereas, uh, for example, during COVID, the state of emergency was declared on sexual and gender-based violence. When you try to look at the budgeting, uh, for that, you will see almost zero budget, you know, going into, into that. Uh, information, access to information, access to justice. Uh, these are the areas that we need to, um, uh, that the book also have mentioned in terms of accountability, accountability to uh, regional and international uh, instrument or normative framework that uh, countries have ratified. So uh, uh, chapter 12 on lessons learned from, uh, um, from litigation, uh, to looking at, uh, um, I think what I see uh, is the issue of uh, ac the, the accountability, accountability, state responsibility, uh, working with men, involving men, it takes two to tango. And that duality, even within the African context, is also part of our own particularities or peculiarities for which uh, uh, we should uh, pay attention. But that, of course, just like the chapter, uh, six mentioned is not without a uh, constraint, but then uh, it, it's, it's a work in progress and some civil society have had very good uh, lessons, uh, especially even working with even traditional uh, and, and religious institutions. Uh, it, it is, the resistance wouldn't go away overnight, but I think it's the persistence uh, and strategic litigation. Uh, so I look at this book, I think the partnership, even the ISLA uh, being part of it, is uh, something that is uh, very, very encouraging uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you will think that civil society uh, have a role to play here. Collaborative scholarship, yes, very important, but also as we do that solidarity in terms of activism and then uh, the, 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 the academia uh, working with the civil society group with those uh, involved in promotion or advancing SRHR right into uh, should uh, they should partner. So uh, with regard to that, with regard to strategic uh, litigation, 
uh, it, it, it's really uh, important. And then uh, going forward, we look at again the issue of budgeting, financing, um, especially uh, opportunities for public private partnership. What does SDG uh, partnership or cooperation in goal 17 mean? What does it mean? Uh, also to develop local jurisprudence around this area. I think um, one of the things I normally even at the UN Special Rapporteur I talk about the, the gaps in the three Cs, the issue of capacity cooperation. Um, it, 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 these are just very, uh, very, very important things that, and, and coordination. Uh, so with this, we, we, we see that uh, this book is, uh, is really uh, is a landmark book is, is one that uh, many will, found, uh, will find useful, uh, not just in the academia, but in the, in the civil society activism and for feminists as well. And then the way it has taken on the issue of sexual minorities uh, is, is very important because this is where you know, the xenophobia or the, you know, the, the discrimination is quite uh, uh, deep in the continent. And even within threatening even academic uh, uh, institutions, because I recall once, I mean, I had all this uh, petition flying, I was teaching in the university that I have uh, content that they, they consider uh, to be part of, uh, you know, within the prohibited same-sex marriage or how to be talking about LGBT and they didn't want it and people were petitioning right from Kenya. I mean, so when you think of the global, I mean, continental influence, that if people can organize within the African region to be petitioning my university, uh, that we have introduced curriculum that may, and it wasn't exactly, of course, not correct, but they have uh, introduced curriculum that deals with LGBT. So they want to shut you up from talking about even the issues. And when you look at the law, uh, like SEMSEF, right, that talks about even advocacy for people advocating uh, for those uh, rights, being uh, facing even likelihood of, uh, of, of sanctions or being penalized under the law is a very serious uh, matter. So the academic freedom there is, is important. So we will continue to talk about this. And I hope beyond this virtual launch uh, that this book can be launched in, in key strategic uh, countries of, uh, of, of Africa. We go west, east, and, um, and, and north, in northern Africa. I will, I will gladly be happy uh, to host uh, even a launch uh, within, within Nigeria of, of this book, I think is one whose time has come. And I think uh, in the COVID world, uh, we need to talk about this uh, and the time is now. Thank you again and congratulations to the author for a brilliant work and all the contributors. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Azadia, um, particularly for, for, for drawing out the importance of the law. Um, in, an, in an area where, uh, as you say, sin has been translated into crime. Um, we will turn our attention to one of the editors of the book, uh, Gladys Mirugi Mukundi, who is a researcher at the Dula Omar Institute, a think tank engaged in law and policy research, teaching and advocacy on governance and human rights in Africa, is based at the University of the Western Cape, her research expertise and interest are in human rights, socioeconomic rights, social justice and inclusive societies, women and access to housing, the rule of law as well as corruption. Um, over to you, Gladys. Can you hear us, Gladys? It looks like we might have lost connection. Are you with us, Gladys? I think we have an issue with sound. Whilst we resolve that, I think we'll turn to one of the authors, um, Dr. Satang Nabane, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria. Her research interests and expertise are in human rights, women's rights, 
sexual and reproductive rights, democratization, and constitutionalism. Um, Dr. Nabane will connect with us via video, pre-recorded video. I am honored to be at this mm -hmm. virtual lunch of Advancing Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights in Africa, Constraints and Opportunities book. This collective volume is a timely and significant contribution to the current discourse on sexual and reproductive health and rights from different perspective based on the African context. I am excited about my two chapters, which I will briefly talk about. The first chapter, chapter two, abortion and conscientious objection in South Africa. The need for regulation is based on my doctoral thesis titled Power Dynamics in the Provision of Legal Abortion, a Feminist Perspective for Gnosis and Conscientious Objection in South Africa. In this chapter, I examine the lack of regulation regarding the scope of the exercise of conscientious objection to abortion in South Africa. For the record, conscientious objection has been defined as a refusal to participate in an activity that an individual considers incompatible with his or her religious, moral, philosophical, or ethical beliefs. I sought to clarify the essential conditions needed to ensure the women who seek access to abortion services are treated with respect for their reproductive autonomy and human dignity. I showed that the failure to effectively regulate and monitor such refusals have served as a barrier to women's ability to obtain safe and legal abortion in South Africa. I conclude by reflecting on how the right to freedom of conscience should be balanced with women's right to legal abortion services and care. The second one, chapter eight, is a joint one with Professor Dure Jaya, address, addressing, um, titled rather, Addressing Female Genital Cutting or Mutilation in the Gambia Beyond Criminalization. In the chapter, we discuss the nexus between FGM and human rights, as well as the reasons often advanced to support the use of criminal law to address FGM. The central focus of the chapter is the amendment to the Women's Act of 2015, which prohibits FGM in the Gambia. We evaluated the utility of the approach adopted by the Gambian government vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis its obligations under the Maputo Protocol. We argue that beyond criminalization, states should ensure that mechanisms are in place that address prevention, protection, prosecution, and provision of rehabilitation services as well as public awareness and education that is aimed at changing behaviors and attitudes that condone and justify the practice of FGM. As illustrated from the short synopsis of the two chapters, the intersecting factors raised in these two papers highlight few pressing challenges related to sexual and reproductive health and rights. First, the South African Choice and Termination of Pregnancy Act is effect to the constitutional right to make decisions about one's reproduction and to security in and control over one's body. It also gives effect to the right to have access to reproductive health care services. These rights are intimately linked to the enjoyment of the rights to dignity, privacy, and equality. The right to access safe and legal abortion as provided in the Act is emboldened by certain international human rights norms and standards. Therefore, South Africa's failure to effectively regulate the practice contravenes its international human rights obligations, which requires that where states allow healthcare professionals to refuse to provide abortion care on grounds of conscience or religion, they must establish effective legal and oversight framework to ensure that such refusals do not hinder women's access to legal abortion in practice. Second, addressing the issue of FGM, which is a form of gender-based violence against women and girls, is critical to protecting sexual and reproductive health and rights. Our chapter on the Gambia shows that legal prohibition is not necessarily a guarantee that girls and women will be protected against FGM. As a result, the Gambian government needs to do more to ensure that the anti-FGM law is effectively enforced and implemented. My two chapters, along with the rest of the chapters in the collected volume, re-echo the urgency to ensure sexual and reproductive health and realize reproductive rights. Thank you all for your kind attention. Um, wonderful. Uh, we'll turn over to Dr. Godfrey Kangaude who is a lawyer, researcher, 
and an advocate for sexual and reproductive rights in Malawi. His research interests focus on the intersection of gender, sexuality, and law, especially concerning children and adolescents, who's also an author um, in this book. Over to you, Dr. Kangal. Dr. Kangaude, you are still muted. <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, okay, yes. Okay, so um, thank you, Ruda, and uh, thank you for the conveners uh, for inviting me to speak on my book chapter, uh, which is entitled Positive Approaches to Childhood Sexuality and Transforming Gender Norms in Malawi. So as the title suggests, the chapter focuses on children and discusses how gender norms influence the way adults interact with children to shape the child's sexual health experience. And in the chapter, I attempt to deal with the foundational question about where and at what age does society intervene to address some of the uh, sexual health challenges that children and adolescents face. So I engage the reader to imagine how adults communicate to children in their everyday uh, interactions uh, from a young age, values about sexual relations uh, and, and power. So uh, using Malawi as a case study, I then look at laws through which society intervene uh, to address sexual health challenges um, that young people face and how these laws contribute to the shaping of the sexual health trajectories of um, young people. So I draw attention to the fact that laws could be enabling, but implemented in a manner that misses the foundation of fact. And that is that the child is an evolving sexual being with uh, an evolving capacity for sexual expression. So in the chapter, I examine Malawi's gender equality law, which uh, explicitly recognizes sexual and reproductive health and rights, and then discuss the application of sexual health and rights to the child. And this might sound crazy or sound rather radical. I mean, talking about sexual rights of the child because uh, uh, children are mostly perceived as objects of protection including from sexuality itself. I, however, do support the claims I make using the language that I found progressive in childhood and um, sexuality tech, in the general comments of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. So for instance, the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, observes that when, should, when girls uh, start to express themselves uh, sexually, society tends to react negatively rather than to support them to realize their rights, including the right to make decisions about their sexual conduct and relations. So in the chapter, I, I, I persuade policy actors uh, and, and implementers uh, interpret or implement the law to perceive the child as having that evolving capacity to determine their sexual life, even from an early age. So society therefore should facilitate creating an environment in which the child realizes sexual health rights, such as the right to choose whether to be sexually active or not. Um, so I do believe that this is crucial to support young people uh, first to address the health, sexual health challenges that they encounter, but to also transform the uh, gender inequitable social norms that underlie uh, the way we uh, perceive and treat um, uh, the child. So um, I think that um, the, the point that the, 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 uh, in a nutshell the chapter makes is that the child is a sexual being and we must start to address the issues that they are going to face in the future when uh, the child is uh, young, even before the age of 10. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kangaude. Um, I will turn over to you, Dr. Gladys.
Thank you, Ruben. Apologies. And yeah. um, we are having trouble hearing you. The connection uh, is poor. Now, uh, um, briefly, uh, um, Dr. Morris? I was requested to speak about the journey to the book. Um, it began in 2018 when we, uh, Dola Omar Institute organized a colloquium in conjunction with the Kenya Legal Ethical Network on HIV and AIDS, Kenlin. Um, and the colloquium, okay, is that better? The two, just for that, can you hear me now? Yes, the two-day colloquium took place um, the two-day colloquium took place in Johannesburg in 2018, um, and it was um, under the theme Advancing Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights in East and Southern Africa, and was funded by Amplified Change um, and jointly hosted by Kellen, as well as the Initiative for Strategic Litigation in Africa, ISLA. The objectives of the colloquium were, among others, to review recent development in sexual and reproductive health and rights at the international, regional, and national level, uh, build capacity of person between regional and sub regional human rights bodies. The colloquium had a diverse group of participants book. So some were scholars, human rights practitioners, national human rights uh, policy makers as well as representatives from the regional and multilateral development agencies. Participants at the colloquium agreed that while issues relating to sexual and reproductive health rights remain contested in many parts of the world, and in particular in Africa, recent developments such as the adoption of the Maputo Protocol um, and the clarification provided by the African courts, such as ECOWAS and the East African Court of Justice, provide great opportunities to further advance sexual and reproductive health and rights for women in Africa. We thank all the participants that participated in this colloquium. Uh, it was insightful and very engaging. Uh, as an overview of the book, the papers presented at the colloquium were developed into book chapters. Some of the papers, uh, um, and other papers were sourced from contributors who couldn't attend the colloquium. Um, the book has 14 chapters with contributions from um, arranging three parts. So part one contains five chapters addressing issues related to reproductive health and rights, such as abortion, access to contraceptive services, role of men in advancing sexual and reproductive health rights. Part two, which contains another five chapters, deals with sexual and reproductive health rights, such as adolescence health, sexual health, harmful cultural practices, gender identity, and sexual orientation. The chapters features um, uh, chapters that seek to address mechanisms uh, of realizing sexual and reproductive health and rights in Africa. So this is where we focus on the role of litigation, uh, as well as the role of human rights institutions, and also the role of regional human rights bodies. While contributions uh, from the French and Lusophone speaking countries due to language barriers. This book is significant because it contributes to knowledge, current debate and topical issues sexual reproductive health. It addresses important issues that, um, often, that are often immersed in controversy. By discussing the importance of litigation as a means of advancing sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa, this book addresses contemporary issues 
relating to the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Uh, by giving on behalf of the editors, Professor Duro Jai, Professor Nguyen and myself, I thank all the presenters and discussants who took time to put on advancing sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa. We are indebted to the authors who contributed to the book and watched the presentation to book chapter publication journey with us. An ethical network on HIV and AIDS, Kelly, as well as the Initiative for Strategic Litigation in Africa, ISLA. We are grateful to Amplify Change for their generosity giving, um, financially supporting this series of colloquiums. Editors are appreciative of the support received from colleagues at the Dola Omar Institute at the University of the Western Cape, as well as the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria during the preparation of this book. Special thanks goes to Kay Sapto and Valma Hendricks for organizing the series of colloquiums. Paula Knight for assisting with the finalization of the manuscript. Yolanda from Center for Human Rights for seamlessly organizing this virtual book launch, and Renee Alfonso for. We hope that the researchers, um, students, civil society organizations, representative um, civil society organizations, as well as representatives from regional organizations, will find this book useful. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gladys. Um, I am cognizant of the time we are past the top of the hour, um, but just want to reiterate congratulations to the editors, the authors, and really to the continent um, on the launch of this book. Um, we have only one question, and I don't know if um, those who are able to stay um, can hang in. There's a question from Moses who's asking what is the link between SRHR and child marriages uh, that are so rampant in most countries on the continent? If any of our panelists would like to take on that question. Um, maybe you can, I, I wonder whether Dr. Kangawude uh, can speak from your perspective about children and how marriage impacts on uh, sexual and reproductive health. Are you able to do that? Yes, uh, of course. So, um... So uh, when a child uh, marries early, then uh, obviously there's going to be uh, certain challenges she's going to face because of uh, the obligations that we understand go with uh, uh, marriage. So uh, maybe the reproductive aspect is if she gets uh, pregnant, uh, that may be uh, problematic because her uh, body is not yet uh, uh, physiologically mature. But apart from that, then there's, there's also the emotional uh, or psychological aspect. But she is at an age where uh, she may not be able to uh, make the decisions uh, about her body freely and without cohesion. Uh, because usually child marriages, uh, the, what tends to happen is that the, the younger person tends to be the, the girl uh, married to an older man. So uh, because of the uh, power imbalance due to the age difference, I find that it is always the, uh, she will not be making uh, decisions. It will be the man saying, okay, we need children. That she will not be able to say, let us wait until, I, uh, you know, I'm older, you know. So those are the kind of challenges that uh, the, girl, uh, uh, the child would face in that kind of uh, 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 situation. Many thanks for that, Dr. Kangaude. Um, so so um, the, the issue of, um, kind of, I don't know whether this is a, yeah. 
on uh, the, the child bride, the early marriage, of course, it has, it, it is clearly, it was asking, how does that constitute SRHI right? Of course, it is the right um, of women, especially uh, girls, uh, to be of age in order to and have capacity to uh, consent uh, to marriage. And they have a right under both international and regional treaties, including the African Charter on the uh, Right and Welfare of the Child, uh, which was discussed in the book, and also the 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 the, the CEDO and the, the the protocol as well. Uh, the the problem is lack of the age of uh, the marriage, uh, which is um, uh, mostly found in in many countries in Africa uh, that they don't have a definable age of marriage, and and it varies. But then. Uh, of course, the margin of appreciation given by these uh, international uh, treaties for the countries to set the, the, the age of marriage, but it shouldn't be lower than the age for completion of compulsory education. And uh, if you see that girls have access to education and complete, uh, able to complete uh, compulsory education, they will have been of age and, and well above uh, uh, 16. And I agree that even in with the current um, economic crisis exacerbated by COVID and people being out of school for long, and then uh, places uh, where they have insurgency and resistance to Western education, uh, girls are being married off. And there is a big issue around uh, as, uh, safety of girls in school, safe schools, and, and then also safe school is also part of uh, SRHR, right, of course, uh, because you see some of the girls who are raped or abused or exposed uh, because of lack of basic sanitary facility. I hear someone in the chat talking about them making a sanitary path. Uh, these are not accessible to so many rural girls, even to be able to have, uh, uh, when they're in their menstruation, menstrual sex would be able to have uh, access even to, uh, to, to this, uh, which is uh, very important, uh, is also lacking. Uh, I agree there is no, uh, this is also one area. There have been improvement in some countries, but we still have problem. Uh, recently, we got uh, some traditional uh, council in my part of the world in Nigeria to declare early marriage uh, and early marriage and forced marriage uh, illegal, you know, and then that they will take action, they commit to action to end uh, early marriage. Uh, it's still an issue. There are places it's still a no-go area. Um, uh, and, and it's also happening at uh, not just within the country, inter international level. Some people are going to other African countries, especially lesser poorer African countries from certain parts of Africa, are marrying uh, girl children, you know, as mm -hmm. brides and bringing back to their countries. And then the uh, the, the laws, are, you know, permit permit that, and and and, they, and it's just happening. So uh, it's a harmful practice, and it's a harmful practice that is uh, that falls within that. Uh, uh, definition uh, for uh, SRT, right, and is an important one, and uh, the campaign uh, against it uh, is, is going on, including female genital mutilation, even though this has taken all the back burner for, for a while, and, but I'm glad that the book uh, also covered uh, uh, this issue, uh, so that we'll continue to engage uh, as we see what is happening in the rest of the world, even with the Taliban take over and all that is making the news about uh, girls uh, getting married off, uh, the influence definitely, even on the continent, there, there will be some backlash in terms of gains made already. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, contribution, Prof. Zavia. Um, I would like to express deep gratitude to our panelists um, for their words, their reflections um, and their time on this panel, the authors um, and the editors of this, as well as the Center for Human Rights. Um, thank you all for your time participants, for your engagement. I saw rich discussion in the chat. Um, so we'd just like to thank you all um, for attending this book launch. Many thanks. Goodbye to everyone. Bye.